Hello and welcome to the Opinion Center. I'm Shubham Thakur and today it's my immense privilege and pleasure to be talking to none other than senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India, Mr. Sanjay Hegde. Thank you so much sir Thank for you, your sir. time. Sir, first of all, congratulations to you on your 30 years of long journey as a lawyer and advocate. So how do you see this 30 years, your experience? And what would you like to say to those who look up to you, the aspiring lawyers and advocates? See, 30 years is a long time in a lifetime. But for a lawyer, it's a pretty short period. And uh, judges, when a lot of people say 30 years, there's nothing. They, people wait for their 50s. People And, they, and uh, thanks to increased lifespans, we have even people like Mr. Nariman who can tell the Supreme Court that in my 67 years of practice. So just imagine, if somebody is 67 years of practice, that means he has been uh, making solid arguments before the Supreme Court judges were even conceived. It, it, it gives a sense of depth to a lawyer as time goes by. He doesn't repeat the same mistakes. He gets better in that sense uh, if you have been constantly at work. So the craft really starts coming out then. The other thing is that uh, along, along the 30 years, you've made many friends. Some of them have become judges. Uh, and judges are much more receptive to somebody who's closer to their age. So what would you like to say to those who are aspiring lawyers and advocates in this country and who look, look up to you and other luminaries in this country? See, the, uh, somebody else asked me this question. And I said, uh, Dil se kaam kar, timak se charge kar. <laughs> से so it, it is that don't whatever you do whatever is the brief do it to the best of your ability put your full heart in it simply because you have been given a gift that somebody has trusted you to go on to that podium and speak to the judge about them. Sir, Collegium recommended and elevated Justice Sanjeev Khanna and Justice Dinesh Maheshwari. Ignoring the seniority of the judges like Justice Pradeep Narong, Gita Mittal and others, Bar Council of India termed it as whimsical and arbitrary. So do you think Collegium is transparent medium or system to elect? I, What's well, your opinion uh, on that? I don't know what goes on inside the Collegium, but people who have been inside the Collegium have also said the same thing, that it is entirely un a non-transparent. Justice Rumapal uh, gave an interview saying that uh, what happened within the Collegium was one of the gr uh, best kept secrets uh, in the judiciary. So the thing is that often the Collegium is a very transient body because people keep retiring. It is not as if it is the same team which over a period of two years, three years remains the same and then has a body of selections. So what happens is that sometimes a name comes up, one set of people approve, then the composition of that approving body changes and the next set says, no, 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 you made a mistake. I think these people were left out. They should have gone in and all kinds of things are happening. I think for its uh, own utility, the Collegium should uh, better be advised by somebody which is more permanent, which has, has a slightly longer term vision, some two, three should years. Should it be so tra uh, more transparent than it is? What's your uh, opinion? Uh, well, transparency has improved in recent times, primarily because Justice Chalameshwar insisted on it and then resolutions started coming on uh, the website. So we knew who was considered, who was not considered. And if somebody uh, was uh, not approved and the file had moved back to the High Court, we uh, so now we come to know all that. So there is a certain amount of transparency, but I don't think it is enough. And in some cases, the transparency is working against the system. So NJAC, National Judicial Appointment Committee, it was brought in force and then again it was you know struck down struck down by the supreme court of india by 4-1 majority appeal do you think that was mistake on the part of the judiciary or it was a right decision given the transparent medium that it was because See, njc was said to be more transparent than collegium well, njc may have been 
may have been a more transparent body, but it was a body which was much more weighted in favor of the government. Because the government representatives mm. were there. The government representatives were there and they were more likely to be more permanent than the, uh, than the other members in the NJSC. Uh, I think we need a more transparent, more permanent body. The Collegium has its drawbacks, but the NJSC as it was drawn was destructive of the independence of the judiciary and it was on that ground that the judiciary struck it down. So Collegium is better than NJSC given the representative... The, co the Collegium, it was hoped, would be more independent than the NJAC. It was also apprehended that the NJAC would be easily subverted. These were hopes, these were fears. In practical working, we have only seen the Collegium and the Collegium has not been uh, working particularly well uh, after the NJC amendment was struck down. So, sir, are you saying Collegium is a good system, but we should have some more transparency, right? I mean, no, I, I, said I, I also want more permanency. Permanency. Because, because what happens is that the judges who are in the top three or top five, every three months, four months, there is a change. I would much rather that the temporary collegiums continue, but that they be advised by a more permanent body, maybe two or three re a respected uh, uh, past chief justices, etc., who have been good spotters of talent, must be put in that committee of selectors who can advise, mm -hmm. saying that of, of the choices, these are the best. So, pendency in judiciary is a problem that India is facing. So, Deepak Mishra, Justice Deepak Mishra expressed concerns at 3.3 crore figures. Then recently, in recent months, it even touched around 4 crore. Now it has, it keeps changing, the graph keeps changing in terms of high court, supreme court, lower courts and all the courts. How, what do you think is the way forward in decreasing the pendency of cases? Do you think there should be, I mean, some, you know, fast track method or some other way? See, uh, I don't think areas are going to decrease. More so as more and more people become literate, become aware of their rights and start resorting to the judicial system. What the system needs to do is to start thinking smart. Who is the biggest litigant? The biggest litigant in the courts is the government. The government is either denying something to a citizen, forcing the citizen to come to court, or alternatively, it thinks that the citizen has got away with something and therefore it has come to court to either recover taxes or recover some money. There must be also disincentives against wasting court's time. Here I, abroad, what happens is most of the work is done outside court's time and ultimately what is presented to the judge is only a legal question for his resolution. Here we start right from the beginning. We want to tell the whole story as to what happened in grandfather's time and the Getting whole thing. The bush, not and to the and uh, uh, be, uh, therefore, uh, we, when you have 60, 70, 100 cases for each judge to deal with, he, he is more likely to focus on what can I do today except give a date. Okay, which those, uh, those matters which can be solved within 5 or 10 minutes, that's the only thing that he can listen to. We have to get out of that. So, do you think less qualified judges should be appointed in some cases to, you know, settle the cases and the, and the qualification comes with the experience in the crisis-like situation? See, all kinds of... Because pay, all, the, see, it's not necessary that the best lawyers make the best judges. All, no, kinds because, of, all kinds of people can make good judges. But I'm asking that, sorry to interrupt, I'm asking that because some people say it's also depending upon the qualification of the judges, whether there's a quality or not. So you cannot even compromise the quality. And some say you can you, not compromise the uh, quality, it will come through experiences. You cannot compromise quality right. Because a good judge can dispose of a lot of matters fairly. A bad judge can make fewer uh, a bad errors but those will compromise the entire system so what you what you really need to do is to have a process whereby you have judges constantly being made available being upgraded put younger people on smaller things like traffic offenses or whatever see the quality of judging the best among them train them up further 
keep expanding the pool of judges equally please i mean and this is not for the judiciary to decide but also for the governments to decide governments should decide what cases to take to court and what cases they should encourage plea bargaining and and uh, uh, settle for fines in, instead of imprisonment and things like that so that there is no pressure on the system uh, right now where are all these areas coming from the areas also come from uh, from legislation which makes everything in criminal the moment you have a triple talaq thing for instance every uh, muslim divorce is a potential addition to the criminal courts you, you have increased a lot of areas simply because of the check bouncing matters previously if somebody bounced a check then you uh, then you went into a civil court and sued him for the money now you are you sue him for the money in civil court you also uh, file a criminal complaint and who files the most complaints again banks who owns the banks the government so therefore what needs to be done is to think smarter to ensure compliance with the laws without necessarily going to court so decriminalization of politics is very important uh, recently the supreme court i think it was on 5th of december asked all the lower courts to fast track all uh, to settle all the cases related to politicians having any kind of charge or accusation of any crime on a fast track basis so my question is do you think those politicians or leaders and public figures who only have accusation and charges of some serious crimes be barred from contesting elections now there is a caveat because they can also be proven to be innocent and some can be proven to be guilty the reason i'm asking question is if they are elected to the office even if they are guilty they will use their influence and if they are not elected then again it's injustice because they might have been innocent so how do you think that this uh, should be dealt see uh, previously the convention was that if in a criminal case there was a charge sheet filed uh, uh, there was a, there were charges which were framed uh, by the court as opposed to a charge sheet filed by the police then at that stage of the framing of charges if a court found material to say that a matter should go to trial that was when the politician stepped aside from uh, 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 from active politics till his name was cleared because otherwise you see it's very easy because uh, any set of police can be asked by any government to uh, fi- first file an fir do some investigation exactly. and then file even a charge if, even if the politician is not guilty no because forget public- for guilt and guilt and all that is for a final court determination yeah. but do you, can you ensure that there will be fair uh, independent investigations you can't ensure that so therefore the the norm was that if a court after seeing the material produced by the police felt that there was material which warranted the framing of charges then the politician resigned i think that that is that is the maximum that we can go to we can't say that no sooner as an fir is filed people should quit exactly so uh, what do you think about uh, women being allowed in sabrimala temple is it a case of violation of article 25 or article 14 some are saying it's related to tradition you cannot allow women to enter see, then again some say it's about equality you have to allow how do you see this see our constitution also has article 17 which was specifically put in to open all temples to all people it is not necessarily only with regard to the scheduled castes or uh, and, and people like that so therefore universal temple entry for public temples is a norm now what had happened in shabrimala was that there was a rule which was created under an act after a judgment of the uh, of the kerala high court that was held to be unconstitutional it is not as if there was some divine god uh, god spoken law which was uh, in ancient uh, tradition that uh, was challenged or an ancient custom was challenged now let's assume that it, it was an ancient custom that is challenged even an ancient custom has to yield to the constitution the it was pointed out to the court that the essential religious uh, practice is peculiar to religions 
not peculiar to temples or places of worship. Otherwise, as many temples uh, there are or places of worship there are, there will be uh, some practice or the other which is claimed as an essential practice of that. So, uh, so in in that event, I don't see any great clash between constitutional values and the religion. Sir, as per Section three seventy five of the IPC, only a man commits the offence of rape, but not a woman. Do you think this section should be amended and made a gender neutral? Uh, see, previously it was uh, not required to be uh, gender neutral. Also, because you had three seventy seven in the IPC. So, if a man got raped by another man, or a woman, uh, now they uh, a woman raping a man uh, was uh, they, 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 there's some uh, biology also involved there. So the law did not go there. Hmm. Now we have cases where uh, uh, against uh, uh, without. The full consent of the man. There have been in events which have been taking place. This is essentially a legislative call, as far as that is concerned. I am only explaining how previously you had three seventy five, three seventy six for one one set of sexual action again without consent, and three seventy seven for the other. Now that three seventy seven has been read down into uh, into only a specific part, maybe it is time to. Amalgamate the two sections and and render a gender neutral uh, explanation of the law. So there has been a lot of debate, deliberation, and talk about whether marital rape should be criminalized or not. Some have said that it will destabilize the institution, the so-called institution of marriage itself. Do you think it should be criminalized in this country, or will it destabilize the institution of marriage? I I tend to think the latter. The institution. Ha. Huh, see. The law already provides for marital rape. There is one exception to the rape uh, to the marital exception, that is, if the woman lives has separated from the husband and lives separately, and then he forces himself on her, uh, her, then it is definitely rape. But if, on the other hand, she lives under the same roof, they cohabit, then rape is such a serious charge. And it is not really capable of being proved even with medical evidence these days, because the definition of rape is no longer uh, uh, confined only uh, to penile, penile vaginal relations. But you could have digital, you could have oral. There's no medical evidence. Then it becomes a he. He says, she says. Then you are running into the danger that any marriage which runs on the rocks. The a husband, at least till till the time that rape laws become gender neutral, the husband will uh, will otherwise be sleeping with a potential FIR. I don't think the institution itself can continue under threat of criminal law like that. No, but sir, if uh, what is rape? Rape, as far as I understand, rape is you have sexual relationship or intercourse without the consent of your partner. Yes, that is rape. How do you assuming, prove, how do you prove lack of consent? No, assuming, or assuming, how do you prove consent? No, assu- they, it would all depend on the situation. That is what I'm saying. Assuming, so, assuming there is a situation she did not agree. You have that relationship. What would you do in that situation? That is exactly what they. If she, if she doesn't agree or something, and if she has stepped out of the marriage, she stayed apart. Then fine. Then there is evidence. If he has gone to her house and and raped, but if On a normal day, every day, you uh, it's just like any any other day, and and then the next morning there is an allegation of rape. Then how is the man to defend? Is the man to say, okay, thank you very much. There is an allegation of rape. Please lock me up. Is that how relations are to be enforced? I don't think so. And I in in which case then why will people even marry? Sir. So, uh... Prostitution is partially legal in India. Some say it's illegal. Supreme Court also said way back in two thousand nine and eleven that uh, it should be legalized if you are not able to curb it. What's your opinion on that? See, uh, it's living off the earnings of prostitution or forcing women into prostitution that is illegal. 
a transaction of yeah. prostitution a, a, is essentially a trading of consent if she consents for money it's her it's her it's her body and she uh, she is entitled to it and i would respect such a thing now there's another uh, actual uh, sociological factor that india must consider we have an appalling uh, sex difference ratio we have re- uh, just about 900 women for 1000 men and it that gap is forever widening and you have a huge migrant population of young males into cities how else will you handle the problem unless you facilitate or unless you actually say uh, uh, make these things available for women who are willing to trade so uh, do you think uniform civil code should be implemented in this country given the diverse nature of this country or we should have some consensus among all the communities and it should be implemented what's your opinion on that see the problem with the uniform civil code is that the majority thinks that their code will be the only one so there should uh, be so consensus I, so uh, and uh, once you get into consensus you have you have different uh, uh, views of different things now a muslim marriage is purely a contract the entire logic out there is thought in terms of a contract whereas uh, a hindu marriage or a, a christian marriage is a sacrament and sometimes it's a union uh, in hinduism for seven generations so let each person have their co- uh, concepts let each person have their laws at least let us uh, uh, but uh, uh, however much you can harmonize without conflict do so but the rest of it i do uh, 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 you can provide protections at at places but the essence of it you cannot interfere with so uh, just one minute yeah one of the consequences of the of a uniform civil code would be a uniform taxation code i don't think the majority is willing to let go of the hindu undivided family way uh, which is another tax saving device sir uh do you think there should be some time limits for settling the cases in this country because it keeps on going 30 years 40 years i it's a, it's a very nice thing to say that we should have it but but uh, whom would whom would you put the onus on on settling can you ask uh, why does a government officer not settle a case where uh, which he knows is right but he will still he will he will still tell the citizen why don't you go to court and take an order because if i sign the file uh, after i retire or something there will be another criminal case against me we seem to use uh, the um, uh, judicial system more to settle scores rather than to look towards win win outcomes for all thank you so much for your time thank you so much for watching this exclusive interview we'll be back yet another with yet another interesting personality